So just a, a sort of bit of a, um, a bit of a walkthrough of some of the issues that, that I've come across with with using bioactivity data. Um, and and as as I um, sort of reflect on on the time that I've been I've been sort of working or, or trying to work um, professionally, is yeah we've really gone from a time where you know scientists could in many cases reasonably know the majority of facts or, or stuff done in a particular field. So, so in, in this um, little triptych painting that's on the left-hand side, the Garden of Eden, yeah, there, there weren't many objects around. Um, things were pretty well organized. Uh, there were relatively few scientists uh, and so forth as, as well. And I guess you know the, the, the scaling of science, the scaling and the investment in, in science, the human genome and so forth led to this, this middle um, sort of panel where there are a lot more participants, a lot more things going on in the sort of scientific research space but arguably I, I don't think you know the 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 investments at that time and also the behaviors of, of data sharing and so forth of, of people at that time laid the ground for reusable data and, and we've just been through a, a great um sort of presentation on thinking about how to um solve some of the issues uh, but you know there's now a lot of mess to sort of clean up a lot of inaccessible data um, a, a lot of cryptic data uh, and and so forth, and, and arguably, you know, a lot of my a lot of my dreams, nightmares, and are now like the right hand side of this panel, where it is really tough even finding out the, the simplest things. And you need to use smart approaches or, or have skilled um, uh, information professionals really to help you find um, data, even even in, in even in the literature. Uh, so I work for the Medicines Discovery Catapult. We're a national facility connecting um, the UK community, uh, life science community to accelerate innovative uh, drug discovery. We're an independent not-for-profit organization funded by Innovate UK, part of UKRI. So I, I guess the same parent organization as the, the academic um, at the universities and so forth. And our focus is in particular on small uh, and medium enterprises and translational academic sector support. My, my group um, does quite a lot of sort of data science, information gathering, um, use case development type uh, uh, type stuff using informatics and drug discovery. And you know, for, for those of you you know who may be working in different sectors, you know, drug discovery is really tough, but also really, really, really interesting and rewarding when things happen. A um, couple of uh, couple of slides, really, just yeah, making some of the points in the previous presentation in a slightly different way. Um, Excel is, is really not a gift from, uh, uh, from above. It, it's, it's one of the worst tools for data handling, storage, and so forth. And, and probably the most ubiquitous and well-known thing in, in, um, uh, in, in life science is this desire of uh, Excel and a whole bunch of other, you know, Apple are just as bad with their with their numbers, spreadsheet, and so forth. Anything that looks like a date is converted to a date in a, essentially a one-way uh, lossy trip. And uh, recently, this is just a news article. Um, some of the guys who've who've named um, uh, genes have, have finally given up and decided not to have things that, that look anything like dates because yeah, it, Excel just mangles them. Uh, the data is lost and so forth. So, so genes think cool things like set two uh, probably will have different names um, going forward, and but, but even that switch of names gives rise to uh, rise to issues. It isn't just genes that are mangled. Um, compound names are, are messed up as well. Um, you know, for some of the, the sort of research I do, you know, I, I literally I had Tongan Paiyu um, currency uh, for some of the the, the TOP, yeah, you know, one, two, three, four, five compounds that I had in the spreadsheet the other day, uh, and so forth. So, yeah, you know, watch out for yeah spreadsheets, really seductive. But you know, real manglers of, of data. The other uh, the other issue is data doesn't live forever. I, I guess there was a great um, publication back in two thousand eight by by Wren that that showed the sort of decay of of um, URLs mentioned in papers over time. Um, and you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that by the very time you need to go back to do revisions on a paper or, 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 you know, when you come up to write your thesis, even in two or three years time, 
that exact data set is is going to be different curation may have gone on underneath in, in some of the objects and, and you you find that you need to repeat everything or or actually may even not be able to do it again so it's so a data archival um you know use of uh, electronic notebooks in the broader sentence of the word at uh, uh in your research again is is really really um sort of good investment I, I know when i did my well back in in my day of course i had quarter inch um tapes you know reel to reel tapes for uh, for some of the data i had and and yeah the, the, the thought of, of having to go back to those now just is is terrible um so bioactivity data arguably um and i would argue this way of course uh kemble is is um a great uh, uh a great reference source for um uh, bioactivity data uh, it's open data so it's shared and copied in in various um other uh other resources pubchem um, bioassay, uh, I guess, predominantly, but also binding DB uh, and a bunch of other sort of commercial systems as well. The so Kemble is an attempt to capture a large amount of medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, drug discovery type data from the literature. Originally delivered, developed um, about 17 years ago at a small company I, I worked out. And uh, it's quite an interesting story of, of um, a data resource being spun out from the, the private sector to the to the public domain. It is the world's largest primary public database of MedChem data. Um, you know, these, these numbers are a little bit out of date. They'll, they'll be you know, significantly in excess of these at the moment. Um, and, and also it's truly open data. So it's very clear what you can do with it. Um, you know, it's, it's open data. Uh, you're, you're encouraged to give attribution and you're encouraged under the license terms to share any changes and modifications you make to the underlying data at, at large scale. And, and the, the really pleasing thing is it's been the basis of the vast majority of um, sort of innovation in, in AI, compound design, um, you know, sort of match molecular pairs, these sort of things have, have largely used, generative designs and molecules have largely used Kemble as their, um, uh, as their basis. And, and you know, it, it's great. I, I, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm really pleased looking back on this at the impact it's had, but it is full of errors, lots and lots of errors. Um, uh, of various different types, and I'll give you a bit of a sort of walkthrough of, of some of the um, some of the issues um, uh, as a sort of builder and, and maintainer uh, of this sort of thing. In the, in the past, of course, I, I no longer um, look after it, but uh, yeah, just some personal reflections of, of my time um, uh, doing this. So, Kemble is extracted from the literature. The idea is that it captures, I guess, the compound data. Um, uh, the chemical structure, which may not be represented in an easy to use um, form in the paper, along with some bioactivity endpoints um, and uh, some assays, some associated assays. And we tag things like the species. This is, uh, this is a human uh, in this case. Um, and, and here's the, the biological sequence of an enzyme called thrombin. This is actually the sequence of human thrombin. And, and it's an attempt to add some semantic or some rich semantic tagging to the literature of course it, it complements the literature the text from the paper is not there it's literally just a series of pointers of the of the molecule structure sequence of the assay species and and all sorts of other cell line and so forth back to the so this was done manually um huge amount of uh, uh you know good data in there but also a lot of data where it's it's incorrect for some uh, for some form. So in, in manual transcription, often um, things like the uh, the spelling of complex words like bioavailability just get messed up when someone has to type it um, into a into a screen uh, in, into a window on a screen. So I think there were twenty three different ways of bioavailability could be could be spelt in in the raw data in Campbell and, and as it was cleaned up during um, during curation. Um, come on to some other sort of metrics of, of uh, data reliability in a uh, in a moment. But but there's two sides of every coin. You know, it's, it's very easy to think that the, the problems with the database and the data capture. But but you know, surprise surprise, your know, experimental data isn't always accurate, or, or the way that papers are prepared isn't um, isn't always accurate. Another uh, great resource um, that uh, uh, is, is is you know really 
sort of essential for, for a lot of drug discovery tasks, informatics drug discovery tasks, is a database called Shaw Kemble. Um, it's a public domain uh, patent resource um, at, the, at the EBI. This was originally de donated into the public domain by, by a private company, Digital Science. They, they had a really good um, commercial project called Shaw Chem that, that just was better strategically placed in the, in the public domain. And this, instead of being manually built database, is automatically extracted um, from full text patents. So relies on text mining um, and then registering compounds that are text mined into a database and, and so forth. But in principle, it's sort of updated very frequently. Um, and there's an associated full chemistry download as well. And, and if you've never, if you've never used Shaw Campbell, have a play with it. Um, it is it is really, really, really good. And, and if you download the chemistry data, it's possible to build a whole bunch of sort of alert systems and so forth on uh, on top of it. Final resource, um, and, and, and again, this is, I think, really important for some of the gotchas with, with handling chemical data, are the, the integration, the cross-referencing of various different databases. In my view, one of the worst approaches to this is if you're building a resource to um, download another resource, load it into your database, do all the cross-referencing with inside the database, and then you've got essentially a static view till you do a, another major release. And, and resources like PubChem, Shaw Campbell, of course, and so forth change daily, you know, weekly, and so forth. So it's, it's a Sisyphean task, um, keeping things up to date. And then you've got issues with what happens if the data's modified the final end. You imagine they fix the, the chemical structure um, in, um, uh, in, in, a, in a foreign database how does that affect your cross-referencing and integration and so forth? So, so we developed a, a very simple um, tool, database, API, uh, web service, whatever you describe it as, to do um, very simple large-scale chemical structure lookup on the basis of Inchi keys. And, and this covers probably the vast, you know, realistic um, uh, sort of subset of, of integration tasks that are, uh, you, know, you would want to do in cheminformatics. So you have real-time integration um, of Kemble with drug bank with structures in PDB uh, and so forth. And, and again, I, I think this was a, a good piece of design in, in hindsight that we we kept Kemble as a sort of core resource and then relied on the updates of other data sources and so forth. But, but you are still faced with the problem of if you want to repeat an analysis, of course, all these dependencies can change in uh, in some way. Uh, a couple of a um, uh, couple of general um, uh, sort of comments on or, or, or reflections on some of the things that went well and 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 didn't go so well with uh, uh, with Kemble and um, uh, to some degree Shaw Kemble here, but in in terms of the focus of today, um, look at uh, some of the other um, issues to do with with data reliability and so forth. So th there's you know if if you search in the literature for the reproducibility crisis, you'll come across you know literally turkey lurkey sky is falling down sort of papers saying that you know no biomedical research can be relied on all clinical trials are wrong um and, and so forth so there's a bunch of, of doom mongers there and and in in the sort of drug discovery space there were two two papers that really made people think about the reproducibility of preclinical data so the stuff that you know drug designers use in their in their work so the first was a um uh uh, a commentary in, in Nature um, uh, uh, from an industrial group saying that um, you know they couldn't repeat the majority of um, uh, other people's published work. Um, the uh, and then uh, there's another analysis, really nice analysis uh, published in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, where the again there was there was widespread challenge for the reproducibility of some of this key sort of step forward sort of day and people gild the lily when they cheer with, with the experiments done badly and, and so forth. And yeah, this was, there's also some really nice sort of cultural dynamics here. You know, some of the industrial people saying that academics can't do these sort of experiments, it should be left to industry, all this sort of stuff. But, but fundamentally there was, there was large scale questioning of a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, uh, published data in, in drug discovery. And then a couple of months later in, in Nature, um, there was a, uh, a lovely letter, uh, keep reproducibility in context, effectively saying, hey guys, you know, th this, these things correct themselves over time. 
Um, science is pretty robust. If everything was wrong, you know, we wouldn't be able to make any progress at all and, and so forth. But, but it's still an ongoing, um, ongoing sort of uh, debate. But, but the, the really delicious thing, and I, I, I'd like to think there was someone in the nature office that had a, um, a, a, an ironic sense of humor is uh, that underneath this letter to do with reproducibility, there's effectively a retraction of this commentary because the authors of this that were saying that other people's work wasn't reproducible wouldn't make their work to do with the reproducibility of science available for others to reproduce. So recursive uh, reproducibility, reproducibility crisis. And, and you, know, you can't, of course, retract a, a commentary but uh, this is as close as um, a close uh, as close as you can uh, uh, you can get. So things aren't quite as bad, but you know, trust trust, but verify the data you're using. Um, errors in Kemble. Um, there was a, a a paper published in J Kim um, to do with some of the the errors in you know, say the, the the screening data or the chemical structures or so forth. A bit of a comparative analysis across a number of of uh, of uh, databases, um, what we, um, uh, what uh, Sir Kemble did pretty well in this. You know, the, the basic, the basic issue is, you know, that the chemical structures, which are quite complex um, objects to represent, have a relatively high error rate across all of the data contained in bioactivity databases. And, you know, in this study, around about five percent of the structures are wrong, or at least inconsistent across the, the comparison set that they made. Luckily, a lot of the errors or, or the differences are to do with definitions of steric history. Um, the vast majority of um, the vast majority of cheminformatics approaches are, are essentially stereochemistry insensitive. So, chemical fingerprints, a whole bunch of stuff that people do with with virtual screening and property prediction and so forth. Typically, but not in all cases, you know, don't have a, a lot of stereochemical information in there. So if the stereochemistry is wrong in a, a structure or, or the, you know, the, the stereochemistry is missing in a peptide, um, you know, for a lot of uses, it doesn't really matter. Uh, one of the things that, that Kemble stalled, scored pretty badly on was the um, error rate of the target assignment or the perceived error rate of the target assignment. And, and this was because we actually had a, a richer um, definition of what the target was. If the target was a complex, we tried to capture both components, but because it looked odd with compared to the reference sets, um, you know, it, it was scored as an error. But you know, the, the Kemble target assignment, you know, it, it's if you've got something listed as a thrombin inhibitor, it's pretty difficult to go wrong um, on what that uh, uh, what that thrombin is. We we did look carefully into the reasons for this relatively high. Um, error rate in, in chemical structures. And, and surprisingly, um, you know, if you go back to the papers, at least in, in the small sampling that, uh, uh, that I was involved in, the error rate in publications is about three and a half to four percent. So people draw the wrong structure uh, in the paper, or there's ambiguities in the R groups to do with what's in the R group, what's in the, um, uh, what's in the, uh, uh, the core of the structure and so forth. So you know, there were certainly cases where we fixed some things, um, but certain other cases where the manual data and progress broke things as well. But but sort of three four percent is is you know, maybe the the sort of error um, estimate that you'd probably want to put on the, on the chemical structure data for any large scale analyses. Um, errors in Shaw Kemble, very different error structure uh, as you can imagine because it's generated by computer. Um, the advances in text, well, computer reading, text mining. Natural language processing, all these sort of things, are, are, is is really progressing, and I, and I think this is, um, you know, the chemistry patent area is one of the the real successful exemplars of capturing complex data from large scale um, textual uh, textual information, and there's some great you know commercial and and um, uh, public domain tools to do this sort of uh, text mining. The one of the other things we looked at was the you know what's the sort of underlying error rate or, or variance rate in in the literature and one of the things we were we were interested in this is my first phd student felix kruger back in in 2012 one of the things we were interested in was the the what's the, the effect of a species between a compound binding to the same sector so you know people often say oh we've cured 
um, cancer in mice a thousand times and, and very seldom in humans. And there's always this assumption that compounds or, or this implication that compounds bind differently to you know, a mouse receptor or a mouse enzyme and, and a human enzyme. Uh, and so we decided to um, sort of uh, check this. So this is the, um, in the top panel, uh, this is a scatter plot of the same species, same target, same compound. Um, you know, there's a pretty good correlation, to be honest. This is the, the off cross diagonal view. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, th there's, they're relatively, um, they're relatively similar. There's certainly a potent compounds in a, um, in, in a rat or a mouse tend to be potent in a human uh, orthologous system as well. But then, you know, more interestingly, we had the opportunity to compare the same compound, same uh, species, same target, but from different labs. So that's in the bottom panel. And so this is nominally the same experiment, a, a sort of receptor binding or an enzyme in, inhibition study um, done in, in two different um, two different locations at different times by different groups. And you can see interlab variability is, is you know, essentially as big as interspecies variability. So again, you know, I, it's always, this has led me to be sort of very um, aggressive in, in data pooling. Um, you know, if, if I've got data from a quagga, an octopus, and a, and a human, I, you know, typically in the things I do, I, I bump them all together because in my view, there's, if they're binding to the same thing, they're capturing the same essence of, of molecular recognition and so forth. Others take a, uh, others take a different view. The, you know, the, the curves are essentially indistinguishable. There's a couple of interesting cases where there are big differences in, in um, uh, binding uh, of compounds between two different species, but, but they're the ones people always know. You know, people tend to know the exceptions as opposed to the, the general rule. The other thing um, to, to sort of highlight here, of, of course, there's a bit of data mangling going on, um, but you may be able to see some shoulders on the peak at minus three and um, uh, plus three on this interlab uh, variance curve at the at the bottom. Um, and, and this is where essentially the publication or the capturing of the units is a thousand fold off. So people have published something as micromolar in the text, but actually it's nanomolar or vice versa. And about one to 2% of quantitative bioactivity data in the literature, at least that captured in Kemble, has this thousand fold, um, thousand fold offset. And there's a really nice example um, that was that was pulled up to us yeah, because because people like telling you about errors and things. Um, so a nice example of a, a data we abstracted from a publication, um, and it turns out the same data was loaded by the authors independently into uh, PubChem bioassay. In the PubChem bioassay work, they loaded it as micromolar, not the nanomolar as, as it was published in. The real data was nanomolar, and of course, because of this provenance, the people who were loading the data should have, you know, I, I guess realistically or, or, or most likely would have had the right units. There was some confusion in the literature um, over, you know, over that data for, uh, at the time. Um, so those are, th those are some differences or, or errors or, or however you see them in, in sort of biochemical data. So this is biochemical data is where you've really got a defined target and a, and a, and a molecule binding to it with say an, an IC50 or, or a, a, a KD, KI, or something against the uh, against the target. Typically, as you move through the the sort of screening cascade from a biochemical assay through cell base to tissue to an animal model to a clinical trial, um, you know different errors or, or different sources of errors creep into the data as well. There's you know, if, if you do some Google later, um, you'll you'll be able to find a really nice rich set of papers to do with cell lines getting mixed up. Cell lines really, you know, artificial, well, not artificial cells, but adapted cells that um, are used for a whole bunch of screening or, or biological purposes have got mislabeled in the past. Um, and to some extent, you can track this mislabeling, either of the part of the body it came from or the mix up. Oh, they look roughly the same. What label do I put on? And then you get passed on to a collaborator. So there's a lovely analysis of, of just ambiguities or, or incorrectiveness on, um, on cell lines uh, out there to, to sort of think about and, and worry about. Um, but this is another type of uh, uh, sort of difference in, in bioactivity data that again was, was a bit of a sort of quandary for the community at the time. So um, on so, so, you know, the, the, the uh, two papers or, or articles, whatever in, in nature, um, one systematic identification of genomic markers of drug sensitivity in cancer cells 
the other the cancer cell line encyclopedia um drug anti-cancer drug sensitivity so roughly you know two papers doing roughly the same thing um taking a large set of cell lines taking a large set of anti-cancer drugs and screening them the idea building a data platform to do analytics on and you know, in, in their own way you know there was there was a lot of um uh a lot of impact from both of these papers at the time they were published. You know, it, it really did lead to insights into how to attack novel cancer cell lines or tumors or, or genetic variations on the back of this cell line data. So, so, you know, big impact. But, you know, it was clear that although the experiments were being done um, nominally in the same way, measuring the same type of endpoint, there were enough differences between the two data sets to make them for the type of things that bioactivity analysts are interested in, you know, not that useful. So you can see here, this is a selection of compounds taken from um, you know, a sort of response or an analysis paper uh, by uh, John Quackenbush. So this is an absolutely beautiful paper, I, I think, um, and showing poor correlation um, between um, the, the experimental results for the majority of uh, uh, the majority, the majority of uh, of compounds. So cell-based data tends to be more variable than biochemical data. And in, in this case, you know, there was there was a sort of coming together and a sort of convergence and and um, uh, sort of rescreening and so forth of the data. And, and there's now a, a you know more congruence between the data sets generated you know, in, in different places by different labs. But again, you know, just if you if you've got alternative measurements. Of similar stuff in other sources, you know, really go and, and um, uh, try and use that where you where you can. One of the other one of the other really interesting things is you know, the, the experimentalist can be speaking as a, an embittered um, predictive um, sort of scientist in in some way. Yeah, they're, they're very unforgiving in in terms of um, you know the accuracy of predictive models and so forth. But the reality is that the primary um, biological data, pharmacological data can itself be very, very variable. This is some nice um, online, uh, and, and, and of course, people don't publish their underlying lab books. They're N of three or N of 12, you know, 10 point dose response curves or something. You, you, in some cases, you'd like to be able to look at that data, um, but it's very seldom published. This is a nice place where essentially some, some large pharma uh, lab books were published um, on different batches of the compounds, different salt forms run on different days in the same assay. And, you know, if you dig around this data, you can see, you know, quite a lot of variation for essentially the same thing done in different, different ways. And, and, you know, it turns out that this data was quite important in a, um, in a, uh, uh, sort of patent case that, that I, I think was, didn't actually, uh, run through, um, the courts in the end but the it's an interesting example and insight into some of the raw biological data um and and so forth and and yeah th these these variances can easily be 10 20 50 fold in terms of binding potencies another gotcha is um around incorrect chemical structures so the uh this is a, a couple of nice examples this was found by crystallography so this was the real drug a thing called basutinib um, because basutinib was a, was a great looking anti-cancer drug, uh, other groups were interested in testing it. So some compound suppliers made basutinib, uh, or what they thought was basutinib, sold it. And, and effectively, the, the compound within the company that developed it was the right thing. Everyone else was, was sold, unless they made it themselves, the incorrect compound. And you know you can you can look at this structure and you say well it's it's pretty similar-ish you know it's the same sort of shape and, and framework and so forth maybe a couple of differences at the bottom but this came out of of some um, some structural genomics consortium um, structural studies where because chlorine is is quite electron dense or comparatively electron dense you know the the, the blobs in the electron density the 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 intent the electron rich regions were in the incorrect part of the structure and it required you know, someone soaking in the incorrect basutinib um, into the structure uh, in order to find the structural error and, and the rest is sort of history. But it, it, it goes to, you know, I, I guess a lot of the data generated on what people thought was basutinib was, was wrong. 
Here's another example, uh, more recent. This is um, a, a, another kinase inhibitor, it turns out, called voxtelisib. This is the, um, this is the uh, structure of voxtelisib, unambiguous. You know, this is a, a sort of the well, ChemID plus. It's derived from um, one of the data sources for that is a lot of the sort of regulatory examination um, databases used by drug regulators like the FDA and so forth. Um, this is a commercial supplier. Um, it's a really different structure, as you'll see. And they, they, they were selling this for some, uh, for some time. Um, and then uh, they actually quote cases where their product has been used in other papers. And of course, you're, you're then in Kemble or in other resources looking at data associated with this compound. You're actually interested in what the activity is against here and so forth. And we estimate, based on some analysis of, of compounds in clinical development, that about one to one and a half percent of compounds that vendors sell are incorrect. So, you know, it, it's again an area where the data may be unreliable. Again, if you can check things out, check things out. Um, what's the learning from this? Well, the simpler an experimental system is, the fewer the number of assay variables and the smaller the interstudy variance, and consequently the larger or, or the the smaller rather or the more accurate your model is likely to be for that particular for that particular endpoint one of the, the awful you know sort of occam razor sort of principles though is you know there's little point being very good at predicting things here if the real acid test is being able to understand or predict how a, a compound acts in um, acts in humans and and as a final slide um yeah i i, I like this one uh, myself, I, I haven't found anyone else who, who, who's liked it ever, but to, to sort of paraphrase um, and to misdate Winston Churchill to show the rely unreliability of data on the internet. Um, public data is the worst form of data, um, except for all other forms of data that have been tried from, uh, from time to time. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll pass back to Sammy.